Welcome, everyone. I am Jeff Lewis. And I'm Tim Kowal. Both Jeff and I are certified appellate specialists. And as uncertified podcast hosts, we try to bring our audience of trial and appellate attorneys some legal news and perspectives they can use in their practice. If uh, you find this podcast helpful, we are always grateful if you'd recommend it to a colleague. And if you find it unhelpful, send it to your opposing counsel. Uh, before we jump into this week's discussion, we want to thank Case Text for sponsoring our podcast. Case Text is a legal technology company that has developed AI backed tools to help lawyers practice more efficiently since 2013. Case Text is relied on by 10,000 firms nationwide, from solo practitioners to AMLA 200 firms and in house legal departments. In March 2023, Case Text launched Co Counsel, the world's first AI legal assistant. Co Counsel produces results lawyers can rely on for professional use all while maintaining security and privacy. Listeners of the podcast enjoy a special discount on Case Text basic research at casetext.com slash calp. That's casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. And another benefit of Case Text is it doesn't generate fake cases. That is uh, becoming an, an, an increasing value uh, as uh, as the news of chat uh, GPT uh, comes across the wavelengths. All right, Tim, I'm excited. Today, we have the opportunity to welcome Jennifer Novak to the show. At age five, Jennifer Novak decided she had two goals, to be a lawyer and to be a mom. She's proud to have achieved both. She is a second-generation California female attorney who has practiced litigation across a broad spectrum of fields since 1996. As a deputy attorney general with the California Department of Justice, Jennifer handled cutting-edge legal issues and matters valued in the hundreds of millions and billions of dollars on behalf of the people of the state of California. Now back in the private sector, she founded her law firm to be of service to people who understand the importance of environmental laws, but want to keep the regulatory process fair for those who take compliance seriously. Based upon her experience representing clients ranging from Fortune 500 and national companies to retirees who operate manufacturing businesses decades ago, she understands the stress and uncertainty that a threatened or actual lawsuit brings. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. Now, we're going to talk a little later in the show about what prompted this interview, the uh, recent Supreme Court decision in Sackett versus the EPA. But before we wade into those waters... Uh, let's get to know a little bit more about you. Was there anything about you uh, that uh, wasn't revealed in the bio I just read? Oh, well, there's um, a lot about me that isn't in one bio, Jeff, but I think you'll get a sense of who I am and, and the things I'm passionate about as we keep going today. So I'm happy to keep going. Okay, great. Well, tell us a little bit about your primary practice area. Well, I am an environmental lawyer. Uh, my tagline is that when businesses and property owners are accused of polluting, we can clean up the legal mess. Um, but that's a little simplistic. We do a lot of work both for environmental groups as well as the regulated community. And really, I feel like our talent is translating very complicated you know, regulations and laws into something understandable that people can see applies to their day-to-day -day lives. So, uh, so do you happen in? Uh, do you happen to uh, deal with these issues in state or federal court in terms of these environmental cases? They tend to arise mainly in federal court these days. Oh. However, sometimes we are still in state court, especially when I was working for the government and government agencies would get sued. That's where we ended up in state court. And uh, Jennifer, uh, I, I listened to, to Jeff mention your uh, your uh, former career or former former tenure as a deputy attorney general in the California Department of Justice. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you were able to parlay that experience representing the government uh, and now your private practice representing uh, manufacturers and other private interests in these environmental disputes? Sure. So, you know, when you're working for a, a government agency like DOJ, you know, you have a whole wide range of clients. Uh, at these various agencies, and they're really experts in their field. And they're the ones who day in, day out, have to be dealing with the practical effects and also the mission of any one particular agency. So um, it was fascinating because on one hand, we'd be constantly attacked by environmental groups for not going far enough to protect the environment. On the other hand, my clients would be attacked by cities and businesses who felt as if they were really being restricted too much and it was overburdensome in terms of the regulation. So it, it was interesting to learn how to speak government understand the things that government agencies are concerned with, 
the things they're not that concerned with. They don't care if you come from a big fancy law firm and you're threatening litigation because yeah. whatever. I mean, they're not going to lose their job over this. They're just going to keep going on. Yeah. Um, and to be able to take that balancing and then be able to go into the real world and explain to people, you know, here are the things the government is going to be looking for. Here are the arguments that are going to work. Uh, and here are the things you kind of have to do by law but where we draw the line in terms of where the government is overreached. Yeah. Yeah. So now you can be uh, the translator. It's like, what, does, what, what is do. the government saying to me here? <laughs> Pretty much. I like to say I'm a Rosetta Stone between hmm. you know, government speak and government concerns and the real world. Got it. As you were, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> let me ask you, uh, uh, I think you find yourself most of the time in federal court. Do you have a preference between state and uh, federal court in terms of where you litigate these environmental issues? I think I prefer federal court simply for the reason that they take more time to actually read through the issues and um, understand them. They they have more resources to be able to mm -hmm. do that. Not to mention if it's a situation where um, you know discovery issues are at play, it does help that you have the initial disclosures in federal court and you can't right. play hide the ball quite as much. But that being said, I find that if a judge has not been faced with environmental issues before, you really do need a lot of face time for them to get comfortable with how environmental law varies from what they're used to day in, day out. The burdens of proof are different. The assumptions are different. The science is very heavy. Uh, and state court would afford me that opportunity to at least get in there and 10, 15 minutes at a time, start working on them to the point where they understood I was the credible source and could translate uh, their day-to-day -day lives uh, into uh, what I was trying to get them to do from an environmental perspective. That's interest interesting. So in your experience, you found that state court judges tend to be a little bit uh, more teachable. Is that is that a, uh, what I was hearing? Uh, that they're, they're giving you more opportunity to educate them on what all these terms mean, what the jargon means, what the science is behind the claims and defenses? That, that was true. I don't know that that was their intention, but when they keep dragging you in for status conferences, when you, you are suggesting a bifurcation of trial, so you're not you know, jamming up their courtroom too much at a time, that's what tended to happen. And the cases where I did better, say, at a trial court level were ones where the judge really took that kind of time to get to know who we were and what we were there about. In federal court, um, you know, they write their own rules. And so I can't say that there's really one type of experience that we have in there. Yeah. For the most part, they just don't like a lot of the big complicated environmental cases because you're staring at 20 or 30 lawyers and you, know, you can see the judges calculating in their heads how much money this type <laughs> of case is costing. Yeah, right. We, we, uh, Jeff and I talk on, on this podcast about uh, sometimes the difference between generalists and specialists and how appellate attorneys usually are generalists and you have to pull, uh, you know, sometimes pour, you know, uh, a large amount of volume into, into very small, you know, clay vessels uh, that is uh, uh, the brains of uh, individuals like Jeff or me. Uh, but we're, you know, in our defense, uh, we can we can use that to be more relatable to the panel. Uh, of appellate justices who likewise uh, tend to be generalists and not specialists. How do you, uh, uh, you, you mentioned some ways that in trial court, sometimes if they give you more opportunity to speak and you use that opportunity to, to um, address the jargon and the the scientific principles that are going to be at, uh, at play. Uh, what are some, do you have any other uh, techniques that you use? Do you put like a glossary in your briefs? Um, how do you get the, uh, your reader, you know, the fact finder and the judge um uh, in your briefs to understand your arguments if there's if their eyes are going to tend to glaze over at a lot of the uh, the difficult constitutional principles or scientific uh, jargon and principles. Well, we usually do try to include uh, a glossary because probably more so than any other area of law I've encountered, uh, we are very acronym heavy. I mean, yeah. you're talking sequa, nipa, circla, bricra, you know. Um, but also, I, I just don't like acronyms. And so, for example, in a case like the one we're going to talk about later, a lot of people will shorten Clean Water Act to CWA, CWA. Well, for me, I, I will usually shorten it to the act hmm. so that you're reading real words. Um, and hopefully I've done my job at defining what we're talking about so that when I have to throw an acronym at you, because otherwise it would be simply way too burdensome and take up too many pages for me to keep using long terminology over and over again. I'm still minimizing yeah. the techie part of it. Um, 
but but more importantly, it's making sure you're telling the story in a way that anybody can understand it. You don't have to be steeped in this particular area of law to get some of the concepts. And then you try to relate it to people's lives. And so, for example, when I was thinking about the Sackett decision today, you know, one of the controversies is you can be in the desert and look around and see it as dry, but you may actually be looking at areas that are designated as federally protected waters <laughs> when it rains. Uh, and I thought you know, of, of Jeff and some of the photographs he takes uh, in his spare time. And I thought, you know, Jeff would understand, right, what you're looking at and what you see versus what, legally speaking, you're dealing with. Yeah. Je Jennifer's caption to every photograph is waters of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah. the problem that Justice Thomas has in the Sackett decision. So I hate to keep bringing that one up, but you, you nailed it. Yeah. So, Jennifer, what do you think uh, your clients or opposing counsel or judges might say uh, is unique about either you or your legal practice or how you approach cases? I've been called a straight shooter. Um, so even if I'm working with environmentalists on a pro-environment case or you know, I'm working with people who traditionally represent only defendants uh, and they're being prosecuted for an environmental issue, I kind of tend to have the same opinions regardless of which side I'm I'm on. The only question is, given the facts of that situation or given the policies at stake, where you're drawing the line. So you're not you're not going to tend to find me on one extreme or the other. And I, I think that helps in trying to navigate what's really at stake. Um, you know, where someone's going to waste time fighting about things that don't really matter and, you know, where you can tell somebody like, hey, this is actually a really good deal because it could get a lot worse for you. So I, I think that that helps. And plus, as I mentioned before, we do straddle the line where sometimes we will represent environmental groups. So uh, that gives us a pretty good balanced sense of where I think the law should be. Interesting. Okay. Do you have a favorite uh, or best war story from your years in the trenches fighting uh, environmental battles? Yeah, I don't know if it's a favorite story, but it certainly is an unforgettable one. And it comes from when I was representing the appellant down in Orange County, the 4th District Court of Appeal. Um, we were late in the calendar and we were sitting there suffering through a stuffy courtroom. You know, the cases are dragging on. Everyone's taking maximum time. And with about three or four cases still to go before ours, I decided I just got to get up and get my energy back up. And I left the courtroom and I ate a granola bar in the hallway. A client of mine came out. We chatted about strategy for a few minutes. I went to the bathroom. And as I'm washing my hands, about to leave the bathroom, the door bursts open and one of my clients screams, they've just called your case. Oh, oh my God. And I had to go running down the hall in my heels stop in time to just take one big breath to compose myself. And then I just stride into the courtroom. And I had a friend representing an intervening party who was kind enough to have carried my binders up to the podium. And he's starting to kind of hem and haw, you know, to delay for me. And as I start walking toward the podium, it was almost like a and ladies and gentlemen, it's Jennifer Novak. <laughs> um, you know, I got to the podium wow. and I just made eye contact with each one of the panelists. And then may it please the court. I'm Jennifer Novak and I represent the appellant. And I just started going. And as I'm speaking, uh, managed to sneak open my binder to get to a place you know, where I could pick up the argument in case I needed it. Um, and I just kept going. And about 10, 15 minutes in, they stop. They ask me a question. I keep going. And one of the justices kept giving me a side eye as if to look at me like, I don't know where you just came from or who, like, who you are. It was a very surreal experience. Um, but it had a lot of valuable lessons, right? Always be very well prepared so you can handle any situation on the fly. Uh, always keep your composure. And at the end of the day, we won. Um, so it must have worked. All right. That's a good one. We'll call that a good story. All yeah. right. Good, good, good. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm a pretty boring person, I think. So I'm glad to have come up with a, a war story. All right. Hey, so uh, what's one litigation mistake you've either made or that you've seen one of your opponents make uh, that you'll uh, never forget? So this was a hard one for me to consider, guys. Um, 
I think one huge mistake I see is really on behalf of a party or a client, and that is not recognizing that litigation takes time you know, you, to test out different theories, to develop evidence, um, to make traction with the court. You just can't wave a wand and have the judge rule your way because you think you're right. And I have seen clients who won't fully engage in the process. And, and they then don't get the results that they want. So I would call that a huge mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And uh, do you have a philosophy or a creed that you live by in your practice? And are there cases or clients that you won't uh, accept or arguments you will not make? So I am not a yes man. Um, mm -hmm. There are certain people who want to hear what they want to hear or as I try to explain to them that especially in an environmental regulatory scheme, they are subject to these and they do have obligations. And if I think that you have to engage in a certain course of action, both legally speaking and because it's good for you, I'm going to tell you. And if I sense that a client is going to start second guessing me and making me keep affirming and reaffirming that, yes, this is the way the law works, right. uh, I won't take them. I can't at this point in time. It's it's just too much work. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. No, yeah. Life is, <clears throat> excuse me, life is too short to deal with clients who won't follow their own attorney's advice. Exactly. And I mean, I've, I've been doing this for a while now, people. So, um, you know, <laughs> you, got, you can trust me if I'm your lawyer to steer you right, or at least to give you options from which you can choose. Um, but I'm, I'm not just saying this for my health. Right. Yeah, and you don't want to yeah. be in a position later on uh, where the court is asking, Ms. Novak, why did your client persist on on taking this very aggressive uh, approach or this very aggressive position uh, concerning their, their obligations? And then you're left uh, having to tap dance and say, well, there is an arguable, a colorable uh, claim that they could uh, that we could make here. And that's what we're standing on. You know, you don't want to be in those un uncomfortable positions no, you don't. Uh, unless you feel that it's a, a righteous argument. Right. I, I try to avoid that if I can. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite part of your practice? You know, most appellate lawyers will say, you know, sitting in a quiet room and drafting the brief is their favorite part. But, uh, in terms of what you do and how you practice, what uh, is your favorite aspect of your job? Just given the subject matter and the fact that it is a relatively new area of law, when we compare it to other things, um, right. you know, our major federal environmental laws are only about 50 years old. And the science means the regulatory scheme is constantly changing. So, there's never a dull moment. You always have to learn something new and it's very different from, I'm gonna just compare the words of one contract to another, or did I meet the elements of this tort or did I meet the elements of this crime? Um, it It is both a challenge and that can make my brain hurt sometimes, but it is also really exciting. And not to mention it, it's so applicable to our day-to-day -day lives. You know, you, you, These issues are really important. Interesting. Do you have any uh, favorite uh, legal writing or briefing tips you want to share with our audience? Um, I really try to steep myself in the research. And I do a lot of my writing in my head because I just want to think about it and mull it over and see what makes sense. Um, so to me, the more you're comfortable with this area of law and how the cases apply and, and what's out there, I think the better the storyteller you can be. You're not just relying on, I'm quoting from one case and then another case, and then here's the plain language of something. Um, I will note that I have heard judges say that they can be easily distracted when they're reading, not necessarily appellate judges, but trial court judges. Mm. And for that reason, they really like liberal use of subheadings and indented yeah. quotations because it's easy for them to digest things in little tidbits. And if they just see page upon page of text, they get lost. And so I definitely have incorporated that into my writing as much as possible when pages allow. Wow. Okay. I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. I try to use uh, uh, subheadings liberally for the same reason that uh, when you, when you're digesting a lot of briefs and you, and then you come back and uh, back to your first point about doing a lot of the writing in your head. And I think judges, you know, might, maybe they do some of the analyzing in their head and it comes back to them later. Oh yeah. They, there was this point that there was, that was made somewhere. And where do I find it through these uh, undifferentiated, uh, undifferentiated mass of paragraphs, you know, after paragraph, after, after paragraph with no headings or subheadings, if you add a lot of those headings, they could retrace the breadcrumbs and find out what they re recalled reading in your brief. 
Well, and I'm not playing hide the ball. I mean, go to the table of contents and read through it and it should you know, lay it out point by point by point uh-huh. by point, all the arguments I'm going to make and, and why I think I'm right. Yeah, I like it. Now, Jennifer, I know you're involved in the uh, California Lawyer- Lawyers Association, which branch- branched off from the state bar a few years back. Tell us about your involvement with the association, what lawyers uh, can get out of it. Because I got to tell you, I haven't, uh, I haven't done anything with that organization since since they branched away. Well, it's not that much different since they branched away, except they're no longer considered a government agency, um, and we have a lot more flexibility in what we can do. So I got involved with the environmental law section mm-hmm. probably about 10 years ago. I'm a little late to the game in terms of my practice area, but I joined their executive committee pretty much right off the bat. I served as the chair for our organization, which represents about 2,700 environmental lawyers, professors, law students, consultants, people who just like environmental issues. Um, and among the activities we do for law students are we have a diversity and inclusion fellowship program that awards scholarships to students for summer work. We have a writing competition and a negotiations competition that we run. We have multiple publications which give people opportunities to write and publish. In addition, our main event is an annual conference at Yosemite every October, which brings together uh, thought leaders and professors and politicians and authors, uh, and it's part hiking and enjoying Yosemite and part conference. It is a a fantastic event if you ever have a chance to go. In addition, we do have things like podcasts and other uh, uh, conferences that we put on. And for me, um, first time I showed up at one of these events, I'm staring at former clients, opposing counsel, colleagues. Um, It was a one-stop shop, like a high school reunion or something. And it just reminded me that especially in our field, we're pretty congenial um, and we get along well. And it's nice to be able to have those relationships when you're sitting across the table from somebody on a case later on, that's going to be really contentious, but you know each other as people. And I would put an additional plug for the California Lawyers Association generally. They're really making a big focus uh, of lawyer well-being and mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of resources there to make sure that we're not burning out and suffering as we traditionally have done. Yeah. Okay. That's great. You had me at Yosemite. I didn't hear anything. (laughs) I thought that would appeal to you. (laughs) Yeah. I like that idea of like, like a a legal conference biathlon, you know, uh, some hiking and then, uh, and then go back and sit and be quiet and listen. Well, you know, when you're at the breakfast line and you see a Supreme court justice right next to you loading up, um, you know, his plate, it's not a bad place to be. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Uh, It's time to dip our toe into the waters and talk about the Sackett case. Let's hear a bit about the Clean Water Act, the Sackett case. Set it up for our audience. Use small words so I can follow you in terms of what was at issue in this case and what the court uh, decided. And try to tee up a lot more uh, water-related jokes for Jeff. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, at its heart, the Sackett decision, which was just decided by the United States Supreme Court, Um, deals with this question of which waters we're going to consider to be protected under federal law and where the federal government can extend its authority. The Clean Water Act uh, is really from 1977, and the whole purpose of it was to deal with this question of the nation's waters had degraded to the point where literally rivers are catching on fire, fish are dying, you can't drink water from some places, And where you had some states exercising their right to crack down and clean up pollution, it doesn't help if the state across the river from you is liberally allowing people to dump whatever they want to dump. All your individual efforts are going to go by the wayside. So by enacting law at a federal level, what Congress was trying to do is to restore and maintain the nation's waters so that they were fishable, drinkable, swimmable, with the goal of doing this by 1985. And first and foremost, it made it illegal to uh, dump pollutants into waters of the United States unless 
you agree to some level of regulation. Now, on an individual basis, obviously no one's coming after you for chucking something into the ocean. But when they started looking at traditional sources of pollution, things like sewage spills, you know, industry having uh, chemicals go into the water, big you know, trash dumps, they thought they could attack this by looking at some of those historic sources of pollution and then starting to clamp down on regulating them. Right. The more we know about sources of pollution, the more refined that has gotten to the point where we really are putting trash ordinances in for certain cities to keep trash out of our rivers. But so I want to make sure I'm sure. Uh, I'm hearing you right. Is the is the idea that um, that we wanted to have a an expansive enough definition of waters of the United States so that if if there's if there's dumping in some area that's not, not technically a water of the United States and but that it could travel to the waters of the United States that would de defeat the purpose right because you want to you want to clean up the waters of the United States so it has to be expansive enough to to uh, prevent pollution through whatever means even if it's through uh through a a, a a a tributary far down line but if you if you uh if you dump in it it's going to wind up polluting a water of the united states uh, as traditionally known correct that right? and and that's not necessarily the language of the clean water act itself so much as that very practical um reality that it's not just the ocean you've got things leading to the ocean that carry pollutants with it, and we want to protect those waters too. So that's been a source of controversy from both a regulatory standpoint, uh, just a government overreach standpoint, and within the courts for the last few decades. Like, What do we mean when we're talking about the waters that deserve that level of federal protection? Got it. So you know, with that in mind, um, it hasn't really been settled for the entire time that we've been talking about the Clean Water Act. And there are multiple attempts by the U.S. Supreme Court to figure out a definition. It's hard to have a one-size-fits-all definition for every potential tributary that we may be talking about. And so Sackett comes in you know, as the most recent of the line of these cases. Um, it's interesting in that there's a, it's a 9-0 decision. So even the most liberal of the justices agreed ultimately with the Sacketts who were challenging uh, the U.S. government's actions, but how they get there is in, in very different ways. So from a factual standpoint, you have this couple who buys a house back in 2004. I'm sorry, they buy a lot in Idaho. Uh, and just from looking at this lot, it seems pretty bare. They intend to you know, fill it in and then build a house on it. And here comes the U.S. government to say you can't do that because your site drains kind of down this road, across a road, into a ditch, and that ditch ultimately goes to a lake. And even though this lake doesn't cross state lines, we think it still engages in commerce. People come here, they visit, they can fish, they can recreate. Um, therefore, that, that's, the, that's Priest Lake? Yes, Okay. Therefore, so the, the Priest the, Lake is, is entirely within Idaho, but it can still be considered a water of the United States. Exactly. Okay. It, by the federal government's definition. And because your site drains through various channels to get there, you know, we're going to consider your site to be part of um, a network of wetlands. Right. So the Sackets weren't, they weren't dumping directly into Priest Lake. They Correct. were dumping on their property. Uh, help me understand, there's, there was some uh, reference to uh, wetlands that uh, were the Sackets on a wetland. How does the, the wetlands um, uh, context uh, uh, contribute to the, uh, contributing to a uh, polluting in a water of the United States? Well, wetlands can be considered a water of the United States. Traditionally, you're going to see them as that border between you know, a waterway and dry land. Um, you know, the soggy area where you have a transition, uh, it can catch erosion, it can purify the water that leaves land before it goes into the federal water. With respect to the sackets, they were part of a drainage system of which these the system of wetlands also existed and uh, contributed into Priest Lake. And for that reason, the Army Corps of Engineers said they're all connected and they implemented this test called the significant nexus test, meaning nexus tests, excuse me, meaning that what comes off the Sackett's land and what comes off the wetlands can greatly impact this lake. So we want to control what's what they can do on their their land. 
Yeah. Ultimately, you know, you can read the way the court's going to go with this when they talk about the fact that it's going to be a modest house. Uh, and they note that just by looking at the land, the Sacketts might not have known uh, that it was going to be designated as a federally protected land. So Army Corps of Engineers um, told them they had to stop with their fill. They were going to have to submit a work plan to restore it. Um, they could be subject to criminal penalties if they refuse. And um, it's this combination of the strict liabilities that come with environmental laws, plus the significantly high penalties you could face if the government wants to impose them, and then balance that with the rights of private property owners to build on their land if uh, it's not right on a water body. And that's where we end up. Yeah, and I wondered if... Um... You mentioned that this was a 9 no decision. There was, uh, I believe, six uh, uh, joining in the majority written by Justice Alito. And then there were a couple of concurrences, one by Justice Thomas, who uh, joined by Gorsuch, which uh, I assume would have gone even, even further than the majority. Uh, and then another uh, written by, I can't remember, was it Kagan, Justice Kagan? Yes. Joined by uh, Justices uh, Sotomayor and Jackson, that uh, that agreed that the significant nexus test, you know, was was too unworkable, too I guess. Um, but but would have would have uh, signed on to a different a different test. What was the the uh, alternative test that the um, call it the the liberal uh, uh, the, the liberal block would have uh, would have joined on to the the Kagan uh, Sotomayor and and Jackson. Uh, did they propose a different uh, standard? They actually didn't propose a different standard. Interestingly, mm. both their concurrence as well as the one written by Justice Kavanaugh, to which the three mm. justice justices who are the most liberal also signed on, you know, really went back to the text of the Clean Water Act to say that the terminology is adjacent. We're talking about not just the navigable water body itself, but waters that are and wetlands that are adjacent to it, and really. You know, it's a semantics issue with the majority saying, well, adjacent means you're like right next to, right on top of, you're touching. Um, and Justice Kavanaugh and others noting, well, wait a second, adjacent means neighboring, nearby. You know, I can affect you. I, I Maybe my house doesn't touch your house, but if we have a yard between us and a fence, we're still adjacent to each other. Uh, interestingly, it was Justice Kagan who pulls back and starts with the very language of the Clean Water Act that I started with, that acknowledgement that the whole purpose of it was to be broad reaching and was to you know, go back and restore the nation's waters and saying, you know, the majority is coming at this like, well, as an example, Justice Thomas's concurrence goes way back to the 1800s with a lot of his case discussion about what it meant to be navigable way back when. Um, and and Justice Kagan says, you know, Congress knew all that. Congress knew how they had treated the waterways in the past, and they wanted to do something really broad, really draconian. There's actually legislative history using that terminology hmm. um, and saying we've got to do something so radical to turn this around. Um, the majority acknowledges that the Clean Water Act has gone far in terms of cleaning up the nation's waters. And then it moves on to talk about states' rights and you know, the government overreach. And there's almost an undercurrent of, you know, in the past when we've agreed with you, you've then just taken that agreement and gone even farther. So now we have to put our foot down and we can't let you keep doing that. I wonder if you think that the uh, the reason that that this was a it was unanimous in the sense of rejecting the uh, significant nexus test, if uh, if you think that the maybe the um, uh, the shared idea there among all of the justices was maybe like a due process or anti-vagueness issue that look the Sackets are just moving gravel around on a lot that they purchased to build a uh, what a, a single family residential home a modest home Tim a modest a home. modest home <laughs> and uh, and suddenly they uh, they get a visit from uh, from the EPA police telling them you know you're you're potentially in in criminal violation of the laws. You know, I, I don't read the concurrences as trying to set a bright line test so much as saying it's hard to do that. And I don't read them as t saying that the government's decision to look a little case by case goes too far and lacks due process. Um, but that kind of brings us to a, a bigger issue, which is this one of agency deference. And it's right. never mentioned in the entire opinion and what's interesting is as people in my world were watching the Sackett oral argument, that 
it, 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 there was almost a disbelief. Like no one's talked about Chevron deference. No one's talking about this. You, there's a little bit of an undercurrent throughout the majority opinion um, where they, you know, they talk about the agency going too far and acting as if an agency has no idea what it's doing. Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence talks about real world implications and how those should have been taken into account before we simply have judges making rules. And in a sense, that's kind of what he's saying is that this has been looked at by people who understand the implications of what they're trying to do and, and how they're interpreting the law. Um, and we shouldn't be here second guessing that. It's just he never comes out and uses the dirty word. He never says Chevron. Yeah, I, I did a control F through the opinion and, and <laughs> did not find uh, the term Chevron anywhere. I thought this was going to be the opinion that uh, took a uh, took a hatchet to it. No, I think we're waiting on that one to come down next term, oh, right? Yeah. Pretty soon. Well, why is it with all the uh, weighty topics the Supreme Court could take up, you know, abortion, guns, why do they take up this case, do you think? Well, like I said, the question of whether the federal government has gone too far in what it's trying to regulate within the environmental arena actually is one that that does rear its head every decade or so. There's mention in the Sackett decision of the case we call Swank. Um, and that's one where you, know, you had farmers out in the middle of nowhere, not near any you know navigable water uh, traditionally. And they would have these pools that got created by rainfall or by springs, sitting on their private property, not bothering anyone, but migratory birds would use those pools as they flew over. And so the federal government said, well, the migratory bird rule is that you know, birds are interstate. You know, yeah. that arguably is within our jurisdiction. They stop in your pools. Therefore, your pools are subject to federal jurisdiction. Um, so in that case, the United States Supreme Court disagreed. Um, but we do see this kind of push-pull of the, the U.S. Supreme Court deciding that the government is, is going too far. And there's definitely a lot of discussion in both the majority opinion as well as Justice Thomas's concurrence about how if we use the significant nexus test, test then everything is pretty much connected to everything else and the government can control everything. And then where would we be in terms of states having the primary rights? Um, and then kind of taking this to an extreme level and saying, well, that just can't be the case. So really, Congress intended this to be very narrow. The federal government can only have power over certain things and states get power over everything else. Hmm. Well, let me ask you, though, like in the case of California's uh, waters and natural resources, to the extent that the Supreme Court has now kind of narrowed or retracted the jurisdiction of the EPA here and the Clean Water Act. Does that give room for California to be more proactive and issue more regulations to protect uh, uh, natural resources in California? Some would argue California has already done that and then some. Um, yeah. We are pretty strong in terms of our regulatory scheme here. But so if you do Google this, if you, you know, do a deep dive into what this means for the quality of our waters, you will see a lot of people opining that, hey, this is California, we're going to be fine. I will tell you a very significant place where that could change is with respect to um, citizen suits, because the Clean Water Act does have a provision within it that not only can the government enforce the Clean Water Act, but in certain circumstances, interested citizens can too. And um, you know, certainly I've worked both sides of these kinds of cases, both representing businesses who are threatened with these suits, as well as representing environmental groups who feel like a business is being you know, recalcitrant and a bad actor. Um, is that a difference between state and, and federal? Uh, 100%. Okay. Yeah. So, so under, under the federal Clean Water Act, no citizen suits? Under the Federal Clean Water Act, yes, citizen suits. But if you are trying to enforce a state law for the same thing, there's no citizen suit provision there. You, you'd have oh. to use more traditional methodologies. Oh, I see. I, in I which case, backwards. yeah, so, in which, and, and, that, and so that is a key distinction is if some of these water bodies lose the ability to bring a citizen suit, you know, now there's not the same incentive to be enforcing from a private standpoint, but more importantly, the state of California has become very reliant 
on citizen suits to help supplement its own enforcement scheme. Mm. So there's cases that that the government won't take on because they know environmental groups will come in and step in. If the jurisdiction isn't there, you're going to see fewer of those lawsuits potentially. So some Unless, of the, uh, go ahead, some Tim, of the California legislative <clears throat> and regulatory protections are uh, maybe more robust than than federal. Uh, should the California legislature, if it wants to enhance uh, environmental protection, should it uh, authorize citizen suits in state courts in California? Oh, I can't wait for that fight. That'll be really interesting. <laughs> huh, interesting. Uh, so in terms of your day-to-day -day practice, how do you think this case is going and, and the cases that follow are going to impact your day-to-day uh, -day practice? It's just going to make things more complicated. I think as Justice Kavanaugh noted, um, the Supreme Court isn't really creating a bright line rule. It's just complicating things even further. So, you know, for example, 81% of the streams in the Western United States are what we would call intermittent or seasonal. You mm -hmm. can, they're dry almost all the time uh, unless it rains or you're using them as a conveyance for something else. So is that a continuous flow? Um, you know, if it, even if it goes into a, a navigable water body from there, are we really going to be having a fight over what, you know, what is connected to what at this point and how often it has to be full of water? If you look at the Los Angeles River, there's water in there almost every day, but that's not natural rain flow. I mean, mm. that's not its natural <laughs> river course. That's, you know, taking water from water treatment plants that's being dumped there uh, or urban runoff that's going through it. So. Yeah. You know, even that has been controversial over the years where people have you know, kayaked down the L.A. River to prove it's, quote unquote, navigable. But Justice Thomas would have considered that to be, you know, not the case because that traditionally, right, it's not being used to navigate for commerce anymore. So the uh, uh, the significant nexus test, which is which is now uh, now uh, uh, disavowed under the, under the uh, the Sackett case has been replaced by the continuous surface connection test. Um, but you're saying that uh, even though that does seem on the surface, it's on the surface, it seems. Uh, <laughs> done. I was uh, waiting for Jeff to come in on something like that, Tim. Uh, the continuous surface connection test seems to be uh, easier to apply. But you you uh, bring up a wrinkle right off the bat that, yeah, what happens uh, with these seasonal bodies of water? Uh, how continuous does it have to be to be continuous surface connection under the continuous surface connection test. So that is that is uh, going to be one of the uh, litigated issues to wait for. It's going to come. I Maybe perhaps not in that situation, because I would submit that if it's been traditionally a stream bed and it still looks like a stream bed and you wouldn't walk by it and think it's something else, that chances are we should be calling it you know, a tributary um, and, and giving it that same level of protection. But when we do have other areas where, you know, if you look at a map, you'll see blue line streams. That means they're federally designated streams throughout the desert, throughout other areas. It just, it, it's going to be a lot of hoops. Um, hmm. And you're going to have to go through a lot more to prove that a water body deserves that kind of protection. Whereas the whole point of the Clean Water Act and the way it was written was to make it as easy as possible to uh, inf have these regulations and to protect these waters and to enforce the laws. Yeah. All right. So the continuous surface connection test, maybe it's not as simple to apply as it uh, seems on the surface, but it's still got to be simpler to apply than the significant nexus test with its broad multifactored analysis. Well, the court thinks the significant nexus test is just everything. Everything's connected to everything. And you know, and I would submit that this is also where you do look at what an agency has has studied and, and thought of in the past. We do have things that most people might not think of as being particularly significant water courses, but maybe historically, um, yes, it it did have fish or it was used for you know, transportation before we diverted all the water and built cities around it. Um there, there's, you know, at, at every level, you know, state, regional, local, federal, you know, most water bodies have somebody who has looked at it, studied it, and decided how we treat it. It's just those people are not the court. And those people tend to not be the lawyers arguing in court. And that's going right back to the Chevron deference. And we have a, a similar version here in California and the notion that 
you know, somebody's already looked at this and thought about how we should treat something. Um, do we pay attention to that? Do we not pay attention to that? You know, if Joe off the street can can decide that well, it doesn't look like it's a water body to me, so I can do whatever I want with it. You know, is he right? Um, should he be questioned? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so Interesting. We, we replace one test with another and we paid lawyers, uh, you know, we're, we're paid to argue both sides or either side of the of the question. So now we're going to be translating uh, these analyses that uh, we made in the past under the um, significant nexus test and try to graph it onto this continuous surface connection test, I, I oh. would wager. It certainly is not going to take any jobs away from water lawyers, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, although the no majority issued a clear ruling about what the rule is going forward, I think the court did give the agency some guidance that it should be narrower in Correct. how it construes the waters. And uh, some guidance should be given to property owners and businesses in terms of whether or not they could ever be uh, subjected to the laws in terms of due process. So. Um, uh, there, yeah, I would expect to see the agency come forward uh, with something uh, to replace the continuous surface connection test that's a little narrower and yet uh, still tries to comply with the act. Well, it's funny because I, I just went on the EPA website this morning um, yeah. and you know, they've acknowledged that some of their interpretations are on hold pending um, you know, determination of what Sackett means or doesn't mean. But they also note, par for the course over the last eight presidential administrations, that even some of its own regulations are still not applicable in some states due to various lawsuits. So that's you know, been what's been going on for a long time in terms of yeah. trying to figure out, can we even have uh, a one-size-fits-all rule or you know, or is it, is it going to be as the court fears that you have to apply to an agency to tell you what they think if right. they opine on it after you've paid the money? And then chances are 75% of the time they're going to tell you you can't do it anyway. So, so, yeah, I agree with you, Jeff. Somewhere in there is some common sense. And and the Sackets now, uh, I guess, can move forward uh, with building their house so long as the Oregon uh, state authorities don't come in and try to regulate uh, 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 the construction, right? Is that I don't where know. the Sackets I, are left? I, I, I read the opinion is, is remanding and saying, you know, kind of consistent with the holdings of the case. I don't know if the federal courts uh, get another shot at this. Um, mm you know, for some other reason. But I, I think certainly the argument that they're influencing uh, an intrastate lake and therefore the Clean Water, Water Act applies, that does seem to be dead in the water. Well, interesting. I got to tell you, I honestly probably would never have read this case if you hadn't texted me over the weekend and suggested uh, this is a topic. So <laughs> thanks uh, thanks for bringing it to my attention. You're welcome. Um, and, and I'll, Before and I'll we... beat Jeff to the to the punch for for the last maybe the last water pun uh, of the episode. Uh, we'll have to wait and see whether this opens the floodgates to more uh, Clean Water Act abuses. Huh? Huh? Come yeah. on, Tim. Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, as we approach the end of the hour, Tim, did you want to run uh, Jennifer through the uh, gauntlet of the uh, yeah. lightning round? All right, Jennifer, this is the time for our patented copyrighted segment of the show that answers the most, uh, I was going to say oppressing questions uh, and pressing <laughs> questions that vex appellate nerds around the world. The dreaded lightning round. Short responses, one sentence if you can. Uh, here we go. Font preference in uh, in your briefs, in your legal briefs. Century Schoolbook, Garamond, Times New Roman or something else. Times New Roman. Times New Roman. We're getting a, getting a lot of love for Times New Roman lately. Okay. Wow. Two spaces after a period or just one space after a period? Well, since I'm over 40, it's two spaces. <laughs> I'll oh allow it. Uh, I have to ask this on Jeff's behalf and because it's been a hot topic. Have you ever used the citation parenthetical cleaned up if you're ever uh, quoting something that removes ellipses or internal quotation marks or cit citations instead of identifying everything that you're omitting? Uh, uh, some practitioners and judges use the parenthetical cleaned up. Ever used it? No. no. Uh, okay. Jennifer, as a, an environmental lawyer, I'm just going to suggest cleaned up is a parenthetical you need to look into. I mean, it's what you do for a living. It's clean up. Yeah, I, I, I like <laughs> to keep it honest. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I'm skipping things or where I've left some words out. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. How about the Oxford comma, the serial comma? Uh, I don't want to get sued, so I have been using it more. <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, and then the, I like to ask this one. When you use possessives, uh, I'm going to give you an example. The possessive of Congress. Is it Congress apostrophe or Congresses? Congress apostrophe S. It's just an apostrophe. Just an apostrophe. Okay. All right. And you, how do you pronounce it? Congresses. Okay, so that so the apostrophe makes a noise. We we have a split of opinion on on this. Some people say it makes a noise. I say it doesn't make a noise. Okay. All right. You've uh, you've survived. Uh, <laughs> uh, Can I leave survived? you with one one little um, thing that I know is also of importance to appellate lawyers? Real quick. Yes, please. Sure. To, to the to the question of whether oral argument is a waste of time. I'll note, my mother was one of the very first certified appellate practitioners in the state of California and definitely believed that you win on the briefs. However, my former boss and mentor, the late Norman Epstein, um, once told me that it was tantamount to malpractice to skip oral argument because you deprive a court of the ability to really test out the truth. And if they have mm -hmm. questions and you're not there to answer them, then you're doing a real disservice to both the court and your client. So mm -hmm. no, it is not a waste of time. Oh, okay, that's that's, uh, that's that lays down a gauntlet. <clears throat> We've talked about how in uh, in California appellate courts, you know, you're you're asked if you want to uh, invoke your right to to oral argument, and maybe if the uh, you know maybe under certain circumstances you might say, oh, we're going to waive it in this uh, context, but uh, but you say it could be tantamount to malpractice to waive it. It's that important, huh? Yeah, and plus, I never give up the chance to get FaceTime with a judge. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yes, an another you're you're in good company with that opinion. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Jennifer, you survived the dreaded lightning Ooh. round. Congratulations, you've earned your California Appellate Law Podcast mug. Look for that, uh, yeah. and that with that's going to wrap up our episode today, Jeff. We want to thank again Case Text for sponsoring the podcast. Each week, we include links to the cases we discuss from Case Text's daily updated database of law. Uh, case law, statutes, regulations, codes, and more. Listeners of the podcast enjoy a special discount on Case Text basic research at casetext.com slash calp. That's casetext.com slash C-A-L-P. Yeah, and if you have suggestions for future episodes or if you have a water-related pun you want to share with us, please email us at info at calpodcast.com. In our upcoming episodes, look for tips on how to lay the groundwork for an appeal when preparing for trial. Thanks, thanks again, Jennifer. Thank you. Really appreciate it, guys. You have just listened to the California Appellant Podcast, a discussion of timely trial tips and the latest cases and news coming from the California Court of Appeal and the California Supreme Court. For more information about the cases discussed in today's episode, our hosts, and other episodes, visit the California Appellate Law Podcast website at calpodcast.com. That's calpodcast.com. Thanks to Jonathan Caro for our intro music. Thank you for listening, and please join us again.